Hello, and welcome to part nine in my nagging thoughts. Clap back to John MacArthur's recent sermon entitled, Does the Bible Permit a Woman to Preach? And I am going through every scripture reference that John MacArthur made in this sermon to show that he has eisegeted the text by imposing, this is what eisegesis means, you are imposing meaning onto the text. He is imposing a very self-serving, man-exalting, marriage idolatrous tradition onto the text rather than exegeting or extracting meaning from the text itself. Before I dive into 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 11, I uh, want to take a brief moment and ask you to please like, subscribe, share, and above all, please do comment. I think it's extremely edifying for us to hear the types of arguments that we are making to justify our position, even if we don't agree with one another. Without any further ado, let's dive in. MacArthur says that 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 uses very strong language when it calls these false teachers that this letter was written to address to, quote, receive instruction with quietness and entire submissiveness. He says, want to know how entire it is? Go to 1 Peter chapter 3, where Peter gives instruction for godly living. Note that not only are we about to switch the context from a letter that was written to address false teachers in Ephesus uh, to a letter that was written to give courage to the persecuted church, we are even switching authors from Paul to Peter. So it's not possible that 1 Peter is actually further articulating what is in 1 Timothy, but Okay, let's hear what MacArthur's arguments are. He reads, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, to call women to, quote, be submissive, be submissive, be submissive. Uh, because he alleges again that, quote, built into the curse is a woman's innate fallen desire to overpower her husband and take control. And collectively, that means do the same thing in society and do the same thing in the church. So women are a threat to uh, marriage. They are a threat to society and they are a threat to the church. They must be controlled. But this is an eisegesis uh, based in Genesis 3.16, which is the curse of woman. I will point you back to episode two within this series, and you can skip to the eight minute mark to see the exegesis um, to prove it. But suffice it to say that when it comes to marriage, woman was not cursed with desire. She was cursed with domination. Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And her desire to be one in mind, heart, and body is good. It is her domination by the compartmentalized male brain that naturally relegates her to partial access to his mind, heart, and body that's bad. And that is the knowledge of good and evil that woman realized in her marriage, in her relationship to man. Um, then MacArthur reads 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 and says, quote, You don't have to fear submitting to your husband. That's God's divine order. This is something women have to work on because their fallen nature naturally seeks to control. Everything is uh, oriented on a power axis with this type of thinking, um, but it's extremely naive and it is a self-serving lie. According to the latest UN global study on homicide, and I'll put a link to this in the description, although roughly 80% of all murder victims are men and only 20% are women, of the 20%, of the uh, all the female murder victims, 80%, over over 80% of the female murder victims are murdered by either a current or a former intimate partner. So the re reality is that women do in fact have legitimate cause to fear their husbands, especially those that either grasp directly at power in marriage or possibly even more the man that is covert cowardly and or passive aggressive enough to find a pastor to grasp at authority on his behalf. A woman may roll over and humiliate herself to, to honor her husband and her pastor out of respect for this kind of an interpretation that John MacArthur is preaching of 
1 Peter 3, 1. But an abusive man is highly likely to become intoxicated by that kind of power and will likely seek to dominate her even more. God warned us about this type of growing dynamic with evil in Ecclesiastes 8.11, which says, when a sentence is not executed at once against a crime, the human heart is encouraged to do evil. So when there aren't boundaries, when there aren't consequences, the human heart Uh, When the human heart has done something evil, it is encouraged to take even more license. So if anybody is saying or doing things to dominate and thereby instill fear, it needs to be stopped immediately. And this biblical principle should be all the more true for people in authority and especially for those who are leveraging God's word for categorical personal gain. Philippians chapter two, verse five through seven commands how all Christians should conduct themselves. And this is what it says. You should have the same attitude towards one another that Jesus Christ had, who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave by looking like other men and by sharing in human nature. So Jesus set the model of Christian leadership and there is absolutely nothing remotely threatening or domineering about that behavior. And it does not grasp at authority. But Christ went even further than that. He modeled how to look and act both as a peer and as a slave. In Mark chapter nine, verse 35, Jesus said, anyone who wants to be first must be last and servant to all. So if Christian men want to be functionally worshipped for Christian headship and leadership within the body of Christ, they should be more concerned with looking and acting like a fellow submissive slave than mocking women and telling them to go home rather than spread the word of God in an attempt to edify the body of Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 calls all believers, that includes women, to behave as innocent as doves, but it also calls us, including women, to be as shrewd as serpents. That alone should make it obvious that MacArthur's categorical (laughs) teaching that a woman never has to fear her husband is false. But for a more detailed exegesis of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, I'm going to direct you to a series that I did on this topic that began with a video entitled, Does 1 Peter 3, 1 Command Wives to Look to Abuse Slaves as Their Model? But to suffice it to say that this passage is talking about fidelity and the added benefit that fidelity has to potentially convict a cheater once they're in a position to compare their unfaithfulness with your faithfulness. Lastly, I it is vital to mention that when 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 6 says that Sarah had no fear in obeying Abraham, it is referencing Genesis chapter 18 verse 12 when Sarah laughed to herself upon hearing from God's messenger that she would conceive children with Abraham. We know this because 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 6 specifically f- refers to when Sarah called Abraham Lord. And Genesis 18:12 is the only place that she did. So yes, she has no fear in submitting to her husband in reference to God's promise to bless them both. There is nothing to fear here. But MacArthur wants to rip that uh First Peter 3, 6 from its context uh, of a husband and wife, both submitting to a blessing from God to apply it to women blindly sub- submitting to men that may not be submitting to God. And there is no blessing anywhere in sight. I'm going to leave it there this week, uh, but next week I'm going to get into uh, <laughs> The arguments that uh, MacArthur is making about a woman having a deficient mind when he is twisting the creation order argument that is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 15. So I hope you'll join me for that. I appreciate your time very, very much, and I hope that you have a great week. God bless.